Good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us um, this evening. Uh, we are here for our third Co-op Live, your Co-op Live event, all about Source Locally Matters. We're here at Toppersfield Vineyard in the beautiful Essex countryside, hosted by the marvellous um, Jane and Peter, um, who are um, joining us and we'll be speaking to a bit later, and also by three other producers that we've got here this evening. We've got Stephanie from Alder Tree, uh, we've got David from uh, Norfolk Brewhouse mm -hmm. and Andrew from Lodge Farm. And we're going to be talking to them a little bit later on all about um, their lives as growers and producers in this part of the world. Um, we've also, you will spot in the background behind me, you'll spot Paul, who is joining us live for the first time, um, cooking here for tonight. Um, and all of the food that he's cooking and the recipes that he's using are going to be available on our website um, at the end of the event. And you can actually see some longer films of him preparing the food rather than just the little shots you're getting every now and again. Um, you'll also see to my right over here an absolutely laden um, uh, display of all the delicious Source Locally produce um, that we have. Just a small sample of some of the amazing produce that we have here um, and we sell at the co-op. Now this week is the first week of Source Locally fortnight and it's also the first week of um, co-ops fortnight as well so it felt like the absolutely right time for us to be doing a your co-op live event um, and an even better opportunity to actually do it with real people in a real place um, so this is a first for me so um, you'll have to bear with me um, but we've had a bit of a practice and we think we're all all right so um, this is the as I said it's co-ops fortnight and source locally fortnight and hopefully most of you will all have um, received your dividend end um, in the post or if you haven't yet you're about to so there has never been a better reason to pop to the co-op um, you can pop in use your dividend and pick up some delicious source locally products while you're in there and if you're not a member yet now is the right time to be joining so um, as I said at the beginning uh, this evening is all about source locally um, we have been selling and committing to Source Locally at the East of England Co-op since about 2007 when one of our joint chief executives was driving across the uh, countryside and saw some delicious asparagus growing locally and realised that the shops that we were stocking um, stuff that was sent in from Peru. Peru. So um, that was the start of Source Locally for us at the East of England Co-op and 14 years later all sorts of um, exciting developments and the opportunity to be here live talking to some of our producers. Um, as with previous Your Co-op Live events, um, there is an opportunity for you to get involved this evening and we absolutely need you to get involved. We want to be putting your questions to our producers here this evening. So you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, there is a box um, that you can type in all your questions. And as in previous events, if somebody's asked a question that you really like and you'd like it asked, you can give it the thumbs up and it will move up the order. And a bit later on this evening, we'll be um, having the opportunity to put some of your questions to our producers. So now we're going to have a little chat now with um, Andrew, uh, Stephanie and David. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank, Thank you Thank very you. much for being here. Um, so, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit about how you started. Your, it's ice cream that you're here with this yes. evening. <laughs> <laughs> you um, well, it was actually my parents who started making the ice cream. Um, back in 1987, they had a bumper crop of raspberries, which uh, they didn't know what to do with. Um, my grandparents were actually also um, fruit growers. Um, my dad and my grandmother used to make these amazing ice creams, just packed full of British fruit. Um, so dad asked if he could borrow the recipe and had a little go in the farmhouse kitchen and put some tubs out in the, in, they had a little farm shop there then. Um, went really well, other local farm shops asked if they could stock it um, and the business just flourished from there really. Wow. Been stocking the co-op for I think nearly about 10 years now. Oh fantastic and mm. it is delicious ice cream. Thank you. Andrew, you will know all about gluts of soft fruit. <laughs> Tell us a little bit um, about Lodge Farm. Yes, and your... we've, uh, we've certainly had a glut of strawberries in the last week with the hot weather, uh, more of a tsunami than a glut. <laughs> um, we've been supplying these swimming co-op uh, probably nearly since the beginning of Source Locally with strawberries and raspberries. Uh, it's been a really great opportunity for producers, growers and producers throughout East Anglia to get closer to the customer and 
I've had interactions with customers. They've told me that they like the strawberries or they don't like, they like a particular variety. And it's been a really good experience dealing with the East of England Co-op. Amazing, thank you. Well, well, I know I very much enjoy buying your strawberries <laughs> and the as well. Smell so, them from here. Yeah, I know. It's really, it's very <laughs> difficult sitting next to such an enormous bowl of strawberries and not being able to pick at any of them yet. So, David, how about you? How did you guys get started? Well, we've been going now um, since 2012, and as husband and wife team, my wife Rachel and myself, um, decided just ten, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, we had a passion for ale and a passion for beer. Um, Rachel was working for the local authority. I was working in a marketing um, environment, pr pr predominantly in the in the brewing and pub industry. And we both just thought, let's start making something and, and producing something that people can enjoy, rather than watching people do it and enjoying it. So um, we turned a sort of a passion and a hobby into a, you know, a nice sustainable business. And I'm very glad that we did. Yeah, uh, not really a way to sort of take it easy, though. No, <laughs> certainly not. Certainly <laughs> not. I, I think I'm so, always um, in awe of all of you. Um, uh, you know, sort of entrepreneurs and, yeah. and the work and effort that you all put in. So um, how long have you been working with the co-op then, David? Pretty much most of those 10 years, actually, um, because they were one of our, our first customers for the bottled products. Um, back then we approached them, we saw some of their products that they were starting to source locally. And we dropped, um, back then it was Kevin and his team a line and just said, I know we're new, but think about us. And to their absolute credit, you know, we, like I say, we were a business in our infancy and they, they took a chance on us and it gave us a great platform to suddenly be in stores across Norfolk as a new business and getting the name Moongazer out there to um, to the customers that, the, you know, everyone noticed and the, the local customers noticed and the pub started saying, who's this new beer? So it's been a great relationship and... Um, the thing I really like about it is they, they, they're very ethical, they work with us and it's all done on a handshake and that's just, yeah, to me that, you know, speaks volumes for how they work with their suppliers, so, yeah. yeah. And Stephanie, you said you've been supplying um, our stores for about 10 years now. Yes. So have you, how has that yeah. sort of changed over time? And um, It's just steadily grown, really. We've done quite a lot of sort of in-store tastings and had a lot of support from the co-op. Um, we won the small producer of the year in 2017 which was absolutely fantastic and got to go to the fancy show and <laughs> events evening yeah um so yeah it's been been really good for us um last year was obviously difficult for everybody yes. yeah. <laughs> but we supply quite a lot of theatres and cinemas and sort of visitor attractions and things like that which obviously most weren't going ahead for most of the year mm. so but places like the co-op and the sort of independent farm shops that we stock a lot of them were a lot busier as lots of people were supporting local um, suppliers and local businesses um, so that really helped us get through the year really. And did you find that last year was, was sort of difficult for you Andrew or did you find that sort of things changed or? Well we still kept producing the strawberries they still <laughs> yeah. kept coming on. They didn't stop. Uh, but, but what was significant for us was that the bigger stores uh, because of the reduced numbers that were allowed to go into store uh, were buying less fruit and the smaller stores were buying much greater volumes than they were in previous years. Mm. So it actually balanced out over the, the season in terms of what we were able to sell into the co-op. Mm. Um, but no, the strawberry, and it was sunny all summer last year. Well, it was, <laughs> good, like it, was a great, it was a great summer, so there was good demand. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. That's, I think I had quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you? How has the last sort of 12, 15 months been for you? It, it was dynamic. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, a good it, word. It, it, it was tough. I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of what we do in the, the, the beers which we sell through the co-op are, are the bottled products, but mm. a big chunk of our business is for the pub trade and the cask yeah, beer and the hand pool. So effectively 80% of our business was closed um, to us so we, I remember the, the, the day that lockdown started we sort of turned the lights off the, the brewery and thought when will we be coming back and um, thankfully because we had the bottles because everyone was suddenly like you say we're going to shop locally we're going to um, go to the stores and mm. um, buy the bottled products we were, we were back brewing within sort of two weeks of lockdown starting so Wow. We we came through it, and you know the bottle sales have, have, have kept us going whilst the pubs have been shut. But um, it will be nice when all the pubs are all properly open again. And I think we're all looking going forward again. To that, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. I think we all absolutely are. But and how about you, Stephanie? Did you did did it surprise you the way that the last twelve months panned out? Was it what well? You no, I don't think anybody <laughs> anybody foresaw it. Maybe we should have done. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, I didn't have a pandemic plan. No, no, I don't think any of us did. Um, and you just, didn't... just muddle through, really. Um, like I said, the, the independent stores and outlets were a lot busier. Um, we've got our own farm shop, um, and we just opened a butchery there as well, just as lockdown started. So yeah. we were fantastically busy with the farm shop, which really helped. And um, we're now getting everybody else is now opening back up again so we're hoping for some good weather <laughs> we all <laughs> this year yes yeah. <laughs> wonderful wonderful um so i think that um in a little bit we're gonna um uh, be taking some of the questions from you um from you at home um we have launched Source Locally Awards this year. So all of the people sitting around the table with me here are former producers of the year. In one, I think you're our reigning We're champion, our reigning aren't champion. you, mm -hmm. yeah, David? We've got an extra and year. I think you are our inaugural producer of the year. Indeed, in I was. Yes. Way um, back. So I'm in. I'm in very, very good company at the moment. I, maybe I'll curtsy later. I don't know. I'll see. I'll see. I'll see if I'm up to it. See if my knees are up to it. Um, but so we've just opened our new um, Source Locally Awards this year. They're slightly different than they have been in previous years. Um, but you have have until the 25th of July to be able to vote for your um, for your winner this year. There are six shortlisted producers, and we're going to be sharing a little bit more information about them over the coming um, uh, the coming hour over the show. Um, and you, for the first time this year as well, you're also able to vote for a store of the year. So um, we know that these guys are working incredibly hard to produce the project uh, the products, but actually. Putting it on the shelves um, is down to our store colleagues, and we know our store colleagues are very passionate about local um, uh, and also put an awful lot of effort into that. So, for the first time this year, we're allowing, um, we're opening up an award for the store of the year. So, we'll put some details up at the end of the show and also on emails after the event, but you'll be able to go online and vote for your favourite producer vote for your favourite store and everyone who enters will be entered into a £500 prize draw which is um, a fantastic prize. So um, we are going to um, share some films now. There's six films, one for each of the producer and we're going to share two of those films with you now. We're going to be doing Rhymer Farm Eggs um, and they're an egg producer from Norfolk and then we've got Wicks Manor Pork who is um, a producer from Essex. So if we can show the film. We're all conscious at Rhymer that we, we really must produce the highest quality product we can and we do that with a, a high level of management uh, on our, our, our smaller flocks and with a, a very rich diet which produces uh, superb delicious eggs with a, a very rich yellow yolk. All our hen houses and the pack house at Rhymer Farm have got uh, some form of renewable energy with the solar, solar panels or wind turbines. The two behind us have both and aren't actually connected to the grid at all. And with our pack house uh, in the middle of the farm, we really have got some of the lowest food miles around. So we feel we're doing uh, a fantastic job to reduce the carbon footprint of, of the eggs we produce. When the pandemic hit last year, I, I took a call from uh, a buyer at the East of England Co-op asking whether we could help. Uh, we have a policy on the farm really of always just saying yes and then wondering how on earth we're going to manage it afterwards. So, so, so we said yes. The East of England Co-op were, were absolutely superb with the onboarding process. It went through faster the, than a vaccine approval and we were seemed to be just within a matter of days that uh, we were on the shelf with a Rhymer Farm branded product. Our team were, were, were fantastic whilst half the country was sadly unable to work. Uh, my guys were, were literally hopping from one foot to another. Eggs are so good for you. I think second to tomatoes, they are supposed to be the best superfood. And they come in a compostable, perfect eco packaging that is the shell. For me, the best way to cook an egg is poached on toast, slice of smoked trout. And if it's a Sunday, a little bit of hollandaise on top. It, it's fantastic to be nominated for the award. If we were to win it, so much the better. It'd be a huge boost to all the team and to the brand as we continue to expand and, and, and look to, to, to grow Rhymer Farm eggs and to grow the employment we have on the farm as well.
Wicks Manor is a family farming business. Uh, we started farming pigs here in 1967. We farm crops which we feed to the pigs, which are born and bred on the farm, and then we make the best quality products we can, bacon, ham and sausages, out of those animals that we've looked after and cared for. We've taken one year growing a crop, we've taken three months looking after a pregnant mother pig and six months looking after and growing up her progeny. So by the time we get to make our bacon and sausages and ham, we've invested so much time and effort into it. A happy pig is important because a happy pig is a growing pig and a growing and happy pig produces good quality meat. Everything has to be the best quality we can produce at Wicks Manor because it's got our name on it. It's fantastic to get back in the kitchen, put some bacon, in, bacon and sausages in the pan and it's the most incredible way to have a really good down bit of me time on a Sunday morning. So over the last year we've supported the co-op by adding additional products onto their shelves when there was a period of real shortages of food. So we've done everything we can to make sure that products are available for customers to buy. I would like to think we're a worthy finalist because we've got through the uh, pandemic year. Uh, we've turned up for work every, every day. Um, we've got really loyal staff. Um, we're, we're very lucky with that. Certainly a difficult year this year, but we didn't want to stop doing what we do best. So there's lots of really good um, businesses which are producing food within East Anglian area and we're proud to be one of those uh, to be producing food for the East Anglian community. Well, I hope you enjoyed um, watching those films. There's some really, really um, fantastic producers and it's really exciting. So. Um, There'll be four more films coming later on in the show so you can um, find out a little bit more about some of our fantastic producers. So now we've had lots of very interesting questions coming in for our producers this evening um, and we're going to take a little bit of time now to talk about them. Um, I think we've got a couple of very, very popular questions, so we'll go for those first. So I think, Andrew, this is one for you, but we will open it out um, uh, more widely to the other um, uh, two producers here tonight. So have you had any difficulty recruiting pickers for strawberries following Brexit? Well, we're in a very fortunate position. We've got a, a loyal team from Romania that have been coming back for many years. Um, they've all managed to negotiate the... Uh, problems created with Brexit. They've all got their settled or pre-settled status. Uh, they've jumped the hoops of um, COVID-19 testing on, on their flights over and they are now all fully working and healthy on the farm. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we're okay at the moment, but it's the future that does present problems if things don't change. Yeah. Okay. And how about you, you Stephanie? Um, well, my entire team lives locally permanently anyway so there hasn't been any issues over that um, and we've also had an awful lot of sort of applications for work over the holidays from um, students coming back home um, so yeah it's not not been something that's impacted on us at all and how about you David is it something that's impacted you in the it, brewing it, industry or? it hasn't directly because like Stephanie all team moon gays are all local and um, mm. um, very solid supporters of us as, as well. But um, what we have noticed is in the hospitality sector in um, particularly that they are def desperately struggling for staff, for mm. chefs, for waiting staff and um, people like that. And also in the supply chain, in the delivery, in the, you know, I was reading the other day that there's a massive shortage of lorry drivers. Yeah. So things, people are organising goods in the actual supply chain. I think there's an undercurrent Just there it. that isn't coming to the top, but it's, it's bubbling under. So. Um, yeah, yeah, but um, directly, no, Team Mengazer is raring to go and, and um, <laughs> fully staffed. You can come up your own beer, <laughs> yeah. Um, so the next question is all around uh, plastic packaging. I had a suspicion that we would get a, a question about plastic packaging, <laughs> didn't I? So, um, um, so the question um, from Christine is, are the co-op and the local producers doing anything towards removing plastic packaging? Now, I am not the um, packaging expert, um, but I know that our, our buying team work very, very hard. And as part of our overall cooperative supply chain, they are constantly looking for ways to um, reduce and, and remove plastic from our supply chain. It's very tr tricky to do that, though, isn't it, Andrew? I think. Well, we've, we've looked very closely uh, in our business at how we can remove any form of plastic. But strawberries are a very delicate and per perishable fruit. Plastic punnets are the perfect place to put them to transport them to homes. So um, 
what we've done is we've, we're this year we're now sourcing plastic that's made from recycled plastic and that plastic is in itself recyclable. So we feel that that so long as the plastic that we're using is recyclable and comes from recyclable sources and can be recycled, it will go back into the system. And we're very fortunate in Suffolk to have a really good recycling centre. And more than that, two thirds of all the plastic that is recycled in Suffolk is used again in the UK. It's not sent off on a boat to some distant country for reuse. And just going on from that, um, we trialled last year some punnets made from bagasse, which is the waste product from sugarcane production. It's a fibrous product. Uh, they're very good. You can't see the fruit that's inside because they're opaque. We, what we found was that in China, which is the primary source of production of bagasse, they use bagasse for heating and for power. Uh, but if they can sell it into Europe at the much higher value for punnets, then they don't use that for power. But guess what? They use coal instead. So you think you're doing the right thing for the economy, yeah. but actually you're, pretty, you're making more coal used in, in the country of production. And also once you've got the bagasse punnet, you can't recycle it. It is then a single use bagasse punnet. Mm -hmm. There's a circular argument to all of these things and we feel that at the moment we are doing the responsible thing by using recycled plastic that is recyclable. Yeah, yeah it's just, it's always a really complex issue um, and there's what you need to keep your food safe to reduce the food wastage yep. versus obviously minimising your impact on the environment. And we're very lucky that ice cream tubs, cardboard works, very well and it's uh, we use FSC certified cardboard but we do have plastic lids yep. but they are recyclable um, but it's not just about the product packaging it's also about the whole supply chain mm. so um, we were really pleased a few years ago we used to get our cream in sort of plastic two litre bottles and we managed to change over to um, the supplier using returnable crates and a plastic bag so it's still a there was still a plastic Elements element, of plastic, but it yeah. dramatically reduced the amount of plastic waste that was going to, you know, into the recycling bin. Um, and our cardboard boxes are made of um, recycled cardboard. Yeah. Um, so it's it's about everybody doing as much as they can, I think, yeah, all, all through the supply chains it, yeah. and pushing your suppliers as well to do to do better. Um, and I think I think sorry, I think the point to consider is that. It's not the plastic that's the problem. It's what you do with the plastic that's Absolutely, the problem. Absolutely, yeah. I would and agree. if you can recycle it, then that's a very responsible thing to do. And we all have cars that have plastic trim. We buy vacuum cleaners that are plastic. Many other goods are plastic. And that recyclable plastic is used to make those things. Mm. You're obviously, you were talking about the fact that, you know, your, your glass, your yeah. bottled beer <laughs> has gone up. So the, 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 the amount of sort of a sort of plastic in your supply chain doesn't look like it's the, sort of substantial. The actual products we produce isn't because obviously we use our, our beers is in either bottles or aluminium cans which similar to Andrew is all, all recyclable anyway. Um, our packaging, outer packaging is all cardboard so there's no plastic there. Um, specifically to the stuff with, that we sell to the pubs, obviously one of the beauty of the brewing industry is you fill a cask, mm. you take it to the pub, they use it, you can clean it, and so, you know, a cask can literally be used thousands of times on the beer. Um, but like I say, we always like to push back to the suppliers as well. Um, you know, we buy our local grain locally, so by buying locally as much the raw ingredients is also a way of saving it. But if any of those ingredients come up with too much plastic, we just push back to those suppliers and say, do we really need this? Yeah. Why, you know, we always see grain wrapped in, in um, shrink wrap and stuff. And it's like, well, they couldn't have done that 50 years ago. So what did we do 50 years ago that we can't do now? Yeah. So it's just about just being thinking out of the box a being bit really smart, and being smart the way, yeah. through, the, through the whole supply chain, really. Yeah. And I think I agree with you, Andrew. I think part of the problem we have with plastic, it's an amazing material, isn't it? But part of the so problem is we don't yes, know how to, yes, it's yes. the getting rid of it part. We need some clever yeah. people to solve that problem for us all, don't we? So um, the next question, and this is a good question, is do all branches sell these products? And I think um, 
I think that's probably one for me, and I may not get this completely <laughs> right. But um, I think um, I think what I would say is that the the point of our source locally range is that it is just that, um, and that we we try to keep the products as local as we possibly can to those stores. So I know Andrew, you supply a lot of our stores in Suffolk. We don't supply you? all the Suffolk store, stores. All the Suffolk stores, and then we have another grower who North, who looks after and Norfolk, Suffolk, yeah, and then and another Essex. one who looks after yeah. Essex. So and and yes, and yeah. So that's the same with the ice cream. We supply the Suffolk stores, and then there's a Norfolk supplier for yeah. the Norfolk co-ops and an Essex one. So again, you know, really keeping that, that local, local focus. focus. Yeah. And I live on the Norfolk Suffolk border. Oh. And I know, I know <laughs> that I can get it in the one I go to in Norfolk, but not the one I go to in <laughs> Suffolk. So, you know, that's the, that is the joy and the beauty of what we do with Source Locally. Is, and, and as you were talking about earlier on, isn't it, is giving yeah. the opportunity and the, the yeah. connection for our yeah. customers and the producers on the product. So... Um, hopefully that answers that question. This is a good one and, and quite topical, I suppose, really, because I think many of us are sort of looking at sort of non-alcoholic alternatives. Is, do you do a non-alcoholic beer? We don't. Um, there's, there's two reasons for that, really. Um, the first cheesy reason is my passion and Rachel's passion is for beer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I didn't start a soft drinks company. I started a brewery. Um, so I think it is about doing what's passionate. It's not all about the pound notes. Um, and the second more serious reason really is it is very hard to do a very good non-alcoholic beer. Um, yeah. I won't bore you with the science and the process, um, but it is, it is actually a hard thing to achieve and to do it well um, can be expensive. So mm. there is a specialism, so there's some very good ones out there. The Adnams Ghost Ship I think is an exceptional yeah. example of alcohol-free beer. Um, so I'll let them guys do that and I'll just focus on, on my beer. But it, it is a growing market, so yeah. never say never, but it's, um, yeah, it, it, the quality is very good at Hope yeah. there at the moment. Well, I know I'm the designated driver at a party <laughs> I'm going to this weekend it, with only 30 people, but the, um, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm always on the lookout for yeah. a good non-alcoholic <laughs> um, beer. So um, this, is, this may be a bit easier one and, and closer okay. to your passion project, but the, um, what is the best beer to go with barbecue food? Depends on the food you're doing, but most barbecues, because of the nature of how it's cooked, will have a very strong flavour. So you need something that's robust enough to match up to that strong flavour, but isn't going to dominate it. So usually a golden ale or a golden lager with, with quite a hoppy um, um, strength to it um, will cut through the food but complement it. So in terms of what the co-op stop, our, our pintail um, gluten-free beer or the dew hopper lager, but usually the, the lighter coloured beers match well with barbecued food. Mm. I seem to have some very keen beer drinkers. I have okay. a lot of beer <laughs> questions um, to get through. Uh, um, so, and there, there was a question here from Tony, um, and I think you may have covered this, um, Andrew, um, when you were talking about the packaging material that you had from from China, but it says, could fruit be packaged in punnets made from cardboard or material like egg boxes? Well, it could be. Um, there are, there are, I've discussed some of the issues with the Bagas product. Mm. It has to be waterproof or at least moisture proof. And of course, the way to make things moisture proof is to add what are called PFA chemicals. And they are they're the totally persistent, never go away chemicals. So yeah. um, you don't want to solve one problem, as I said earlier, by creating another. Um, and also, I think most customers would say they would like to see all the fruit in their punnet when they're buying it. Because, I mean, let's be honest, fruit is, has a short shelf life and you don't want to be picking up a rotten strawberry. No, not if you can avoid it. Not, but you won't get them from me. <laughs> of course not. And I, I actually quite like some of the squashy ones at the bottom. They can be really sweet, can. can't they? And no one else wants them. So, um, not the, yeah. But, um, so, what's your favourite? I'd better move on. Uh, <laughs> what's your favourite moon gazer beer, David? Uh, I hesitate. It's a bit like music. It depends on the mood and the and, and the occasion. You know, I couldn't pick ten tracks to take to my desert island disc. But um, I do like our pintail. I do prefer the golden beers, I suppose, as yeah. opposed to the darker beers. So if I if I was have to choose one, it would be our our pintail gluten free beer. So yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, there you go. You've heard it from the the <laughs> brewer himself. So. Um, now, Stephanie, I know you've had an incredibly busy year and probably haven't had any time to think about um, uh, this yet, but have you got any plans to introduce any new ice cream flavours? I've 
have done some tentative playing with aquafaba, um, which was it's. Have you come across it? No, so it's it's no. um, you get it when you um, from the juice on chickpeas. Oh wow! And it whips up like cream or egg. You try it at home, honestly. Drain out your tin of chickpeas, and then the liquid, which looks like it wouldn't do anything whips up and it's used quite widely now in vegan sort of oh, alternatives sort of but yeah you can i haven't tried it but apparently you can make meringues and all sorts in it so wow. we've done some done some testing but um again it's always very difficult when you change the recipe you want to produce something that's just as good and cream just tastes really good <laughs> 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 so yes yeah, so we'll we'll keep working on it but we won't bring out anything until we're happy that it meets the standard of the yeah. rest of the range. Um, so um, we've got another question here about beer. I did tell you there's obviously <laughs> some very, very enthusiastic beer drinkers in the audience tonight. So <laughs> there's one um, asking about gluten-free beer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also, have you got any tips for home brewing? But I feel this is a bit like, uh, um, <laughs> you know, asking you for tips on growing strawberries. strawberries. This is a trade secret, <laughs> you know. And can we have your grandmother's recipe? <laughs> 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 Tip, tips for home brewing. The, the simple short answer in, in brewing in anything for consistency is, is consistency is detail. Be consistent. Timings, weights, um, everything that you do, just be consistent on it and don't 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 rush it and and have a passion for it and care for, for for what you're doing if you care for something that you're doing have a passion for something that you do it's going to come out good so um and just keep trying and no shortcuts and always keep things clean brewing is 85 percent cleaning 15 percent brewing so if you try and cut the 85 percent down you'll find out what i mean but we might have put some um, people off brewing. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't know>. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've forgotten the other question, the, the well, gluten-free gluten element. Yeah, yeah. no, we, this is something we did, we launched probably about three three years ago now, because Cathy, one of the team, um, was diagnosed as a celiac, mm. and um, our sales were looking like they might go down, because she was used to take quite a bit home each week, <laughs> so we thought we need to so solve this. Um, but I've always been wary, because a lot of the, the gluten-free beers that were originally out there use gluten-free ingredients. Mm. Um, so very good standard but didn't necessarily taste like beer simply because they didn't use barley which is yeah. the, the mm. primary ingredient so how we make our gluten-free beers is we do still use barley with gluten in it and wheat with gluten in it but we use an enzyme which basically drops out the proteins to below 20 parts per million again won't bore you with the science for that but the end result is the, the um, gluten levels are incredibly low so mm. safe to be classified as gluten free but you still get that barley taste because barley is still your raw ingredient um, so we're finding that increasing in popularity not just with celiacs for health reasons but gluten is one of the sort of bloating elements of beer or any mm. food as well so it's a bit like eating bread it's a gluten element which gives you that blo bloated feeling so people are finding that they can drink more happily two or three bottles of a gluten-free beer. <laughs> Which is good for the volume, so, um, isn't it? For so, you, yeah. that's wonderful. So <laughs> wonderful. In, in terms of the co-op, the, the Pintel and in, indeed the, the, the Dew Hopper Lager are, are both classified as gluten-free. So That's wonderful. So Tony, I think it was who, uh, no that wasn't Tony, I think it was Anonymous who asked that question. It's um, If you're in Norfolk, yeah. <laughs> you can definitely get a couple of uh, gluten-free um, uh, uh, ales um to sort you out so um we've got we make um this is a question from dilly um we make bags from recycled fabric mostly to support our local hospitals could the co-op set a box for such bags borrow one make a donation to keep i think that's a wonderful idea and um, i think uh, uh i'd need to talk to our, our retail team i know that the space in our stores is is at a premium certainly in some of the smaller stores but i think that's a wonderful idea and we can certainly talk to someone about that um, but I make no promises because I'm sure if some of my retail operations <laughs> team here they would be kicking me um, under the table right now so um, let's see if um, there are any more um, questions um, I think we've done have we so, uh, here we go oh do you do oh, this is a question from Brenda um, for you, Stephanie, do you do sorbets or dairy-free ice creams? I think you just sort of talked yes, about the... Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so at the moment, the, the full range does con contain cream. Um, and that's why I was looking at the, the aquafaba, which would then be an entirely plant-based range. But uh, not available in stores yet, I'm afraid. We've uh, still got a bit of work to do on that one. And do you do sorbets as well? No, or? no, no. no, no. Okay. The, yeah. 
Okay, um, and then, oh, we've got another one here, which is what's your best selling ice cream? Ah, it's quite a hard one. It depends a bit on the time of year and the uh, outlet. Um, but our two sort of signature flavours um, we've done from really very near the beginning and we're really well known for is the, the gooseberry and elderflower, which is absolutely fantastic, light, summery, refreshing, quite like a sorbet, but does have the cream. So you've got that richness there. Um, and I was just out picking elderflowers last week to make the uh, cordial, um, which we use in that. Um, and um, we do um, the raspberry as well is very, very good, wow. um, really. really. And they're just fruit, cream and sugar and 38% fruit. So it just tastes like, or well, the strawberry, it tastes like a bowl of strawberries with cream and sugar and away you go. Amazing, mm. and wonderful. Well, thank you ever so much. Thank you, um, audience at home, for all those marvellous questions. And thank you for you guys for giving such um, fulsome answers. Um, I hope you found that really, really interesting. We're now going to look at two more films from award winners for... Um, the Source Locally Awards this year. And we're going to be um, seeing Marriages, who are a miller in Essex, and Taste of Suffolk, who produce um, pork. So yeah, let's have a look at those films. I'm Hannah Marriage. I'm on the sixth generation working for Marriages. And this is my dad, George. And I'm the fifth generation, obviously. We do nine flowers that go to the East of England co-op stores. So that's our plain and self-raising and the organic varieties as well. And then we do bread flowers. So we've got strong white flour, stone ground wholemeal, which is made in the old fashioned burr stones, which have been used for over a hundred years. We're very fortunate because Essex and East Anglia are top wheat growing areas, top areas for cereals. So we have a, a very strong advantage there in the good farmers that we've got around here and we value them very highly. The pandemic's obviously been pretty challenging but um, we've been working throughout it so our teams are key workers so they've been in the mill making sure that there's been enough flour getting on shelf for the East Wing Co-op stores. 2020 harvest was about the worst we've had for many years and so it was very short supply. We were running 24 hours a day, six days a week, our teams were in on bank holidays so it's a complete team effort and everyone went really over and above in order to keep our customers supplied. I suppose like lots of other people, I've been baking quite a lot during the pandemic. I've been doing a lot of sourdough, so I do that every week. I use our strong white flour. The flours we make for home bread makers and home bakers are the same grades as we supply to professional bakers. It's been wonderful that marriages have been nominated for these awards and it would just be fantastic for our team who've worked so hard throughout the pandemic to be recognised. It would be a real boost to them for all of the hard work that they've put in over the last year. Welcome to Bury St Edmunds, home of the Taste of Suffolk. We're a third generation family run business producing a delicious selection of sausages, bacon and cooked meats. It's been great working with the family and our local suppliers and that, that's the key is trying to develop these relationships and produce, getting quality ingredients to produce quality products. Well the last year has been very challenging, well for everyone really, but especially the business we had to adapt overnight, demand trebled and we had to meet these requirements. Without our wonderful staff and team, we wouldn't have been able to meet all these extra orders that we received. And it's really important to, to us to support the, the local co-ops and local uh, customers because we're part of the community. We did a lot of work for the co-op, extra deliveries for them. The vans were coming back, reloading and going out again. We also had local butchers coming to us for extra deliveries because the demand was so great for everyone. We provide around 39 different products to the co-op, a range of hands and we're particularly proud to do quite a few unlabeled co-op lines um, and the craft sausage which is a real top seller in Norfolk. Because everyone was having to shop locally we produced a range of burgers exclusively for the co-op. They were pork and apple burgers, uh, chilli beef burgers and 90 cent British beef burgers as well. We use a lot of quality ingredients to give a full flavour on our sausages. The best way to have a sausage is on a barbecue. You can't beat the smell of the uh, sausages cooking we're honoured to be shortlisted for the award and we believe that you should vote for the Taste of Suffolk because of the quality of our products, the service that we give and the commitment and effort that the team has put in over the last 12 months.
Hello, um, I hope you enjoyed watching those films. Um, I'm now inside, I've come out from the glorious gardens here at Toppersfield, I'm into the Toppersfield Wine Centre, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, and, and also, for those of you who watched last time and entered the competition, the lucky winner of the last competition is actually coming to stay here um, at, um, later in the year. So I'm rather jealous of those people. So um, Jane and Peter, thank you very, very much for hosting us this evening um, in this marvellous, marvellous place. Please tell us a little bit about this marvellous vineyard. Okay, thank you. Okay. So as you'll see from this video, um, the Harvest Day is a really big um, event here for us at Toppersfield Vineyard. And this is the culmination really of a whole year's worth of work in, in the vineyard. Um, and two weeks prior to actual Harvest Day, we're testing the sugars and the acidities on a daily basis so that we're picking at the optimal point. And um, in Toppersfield, again, we're so lucky to have a fantastic community. We have 50, 60 volunteers from the village come and help us on Harvest Day in return for some gorgeous cakes from Claire and Claire, and then a really traditional harvest lunch with lots of last year's vintage. My role is very much logistics. I have to get seven to 10 tonnes of grapes from the vineyard to the winemaker. And as you can see there, they've just come to the winemaker. They're into a hopper, um, into the main pneumatic presses. We whole bunch press for about three hours, which then we get the lovely um, grape juice out ready for the fermentation process. That's amazing um, and looks like a really fun day. It is a great, great day. day. Great day, great and, day. And how many, so you said, was it 11, 6 to 11 tonnes? It depends right? on our, our year, but between 6 to 11 tonnes we're producing and um, yeah. And how many, how many bottles of wine? It's about um, 6 to 11,000 bottles of wine. There's wow. a conversion rate. We lose about 25%, so a 75 litre um, centilitre bottle, so a thousand, ten thousand, ten tonnes will give us 10,000 bottles. Wow, that's, that's a lot of yeah. work. It's a bit beyond our own work. consumption. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here to help. <laughs> um, so this is the bit I am very excited about um, this part of the evening because I get to taste some wine um, and I've been looking forward to it all afternoon and there's wonderful smells coming from the garden um, and the smell of the wine that's been sitting on the side. So um, Peter and Jane are going to give us some tips now on pairing and food with some of their really, really glorious wines. Thank you, Nikki. Right. Okay, so we're going to start with our Bacchus. This is the 2020 vintage Bacchus. And we start generally when we do a wine tasting looking, looking at the wine. So here you'll see we've got a very clear, clean, um, crisp looking wine. And when we take the nose, again, we can smell some of those really quintessentially English um, flavours coming through, a uh, little bit like Stephanie was saying in terms of gooseberry and elderflower. Yeah. We can actually taste that in the wine, but also on harvest day when we're picking the grapes. If you eat some of those grapes just as they're um, about to go to the, to the winemaker, you can really get those flavours. Mm. And I should say, if you guys have got some wine at home, I know you may not have the Toppersfield wine, but if you want to um, join in at home, then do and take some of the tips mm. from from Peter and Darren about how to do it. And I can confirm that our other guests who've joined us this evening are outside enjoying some of this as well. So mm -hmm. it's amazing. So Peter has a little trick, which we call the dribble test. Yeah, so, so as a grower, the main thing we focus on is two main things in the grapes. It's sugar and acidity. Um, and basically I, I relate that very much. It, it's a balance in life. And certainly we have to watch this very carefully as the season matures. So if you pop down to the co-op, you buy a nice peach, you can imagine, and you put it in the bowl. When you first get that peach, it's very sharp. Um, but what you let it happen, you let it ripen in the bowl, and then that basically that acidity drops away and the sugars increase and it becomes balanced and juicy and nice. That's exactly what we're trying to do with the grapes. So what does acidity do? What, what, why is it so important? Well, acidity gives us length um, and length um, basically helps us um, it, it's about um, the wine and the different taste sectors. So when we first try our wine, if we take our first sip, what happens is the taste bud fires up on the front of our tongue. And then you'll see winemakers often, what they do is they swirl wine round like a, a bit like mouthwash. They put it in their mouth. And what they're trying to do there is they're trying to fire all the wine into the size of the mouth. And why? Because that's where the saliva glands are and they're different taste buds as well. 
So I do something called a dribble test. It's a bit strange, but what you do, if you fire in that wine into your mouth, fire into the size, you drop your mouth and slightly open, your saliva glands are overproducing, are actually starting to actually saliva coming down to the bottom of your mouth. And depending on how full the acidity is, again, how much saliva is produced. But you should try it, it's a great bit of fun. And the trick but, is um, not to dribble. Yeah, the trick is not to dribble. <laughs> or you can try it. Particularly, like, yeah. particularly if you're doing private. it in a restaurant. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, certainly not on your first date. <laughs> yeah. 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 And certainly not on your first date. <laughs> well, yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So we've, we've got some lovely foods here, local foods that um, the, um, the co-op have brought along for us to actually pair with the wine. So we've got here a um, blini with some local smoked salmon, um, cream cheese and some caviar. So this pairs extremely well with the, the dry and the fruity nature of the Bacchus. Um, probably actually not going to taste it now because... Oh, I, I am. <laughs> Are you? I am, okay. yeah, I am. <laughs> this, this is a hard job tonight. So again, the salmon is going round and round in my mouth with the, the caviar as well and then the creaminess of the, of the cream cheese. And then to, to, to follow that with the sip of the Bacchus, Mm. Yes, it just goes really, really it's nicely. It's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's really good. Yeah. And then the, the other thing that the Bacchus um, pairs really well with is, um, is Parmesan cheese. So we've had lots of local asparagus recently. Mm. Fantastic to have a local um, Bacchus, um, nice and chilled with some fresh asparagus, salt and pepper and some shavings of Parmesan cheese. So again, we've got some slices here, which, um, Nikki, if you want to try that. Mm, I will. I think you'll find again that that just pairs mm. so, so well, doesn't it? It opens mm. everything mm. up. It does. It's absolutely glorious. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, the... Lots of people outside smiling. <laughs> <laughs> Eating <Yeah>. and smiling. <laughs> but otherwise, the Bacchus is, is just so versatile because you can drink it on its own. Mm. You can eat it with, um, with seafood, um, shell, shellfish, chicken, risotto, and actually also with some oriental foods. So... Thai green curry, for example, just goes really, really well with the Bacchus because and it's, it's got the fragrance. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So okay. we'll move on to the rosé. So we like our our wines to be dry. So again, um, we always say to people, if you like a sweet rosé, then the Toppersfield. Pinot Rosé is, is not necessarily for, for you. you. Yeah. We like a drier wine and we like a Provençal style wine. So you can see we've got the very pale colour. Mm. When, when, you, when you take the nose on this, then you've got the, the smell of um, English strawberries coming through, mm. a little bit of pear, mm. um, a little bit of citrus. And then if we follow that with the With the tasting, you really can taste English strawberries. It's, yeah. it's like those little wild English it's strawberries first. as well yeah. as yeah, the nice fruity ones that we've talked about earlier this evening. Mm. Um, but, it, but it's not sharp. It's, it's got a, a creaminess to it as well. So we talk about strawberries and cream. Yeah. Yes. Because it's quite soft. It's quite mellow. Um, but it's also crisp and refreshing. And if it's um, you know, really nicely chilled, again, to, to just drink it on its own out in the garden, um, on a summer's day or with a barbecue. I mean, with rare lamb or with burgers or sausages, this just goes so lovely, so so nicely when oh, you're this, actually sitting yeah. outside in the garden. It, this smells of barbecues and chats with yes. friends. Yes, yes. It's it really, it does. really yeah. powerful. Yes, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It really does evoke, you know, summer and barbecue, doesn't mm. it? It really does. Yeah. 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 And good yeah. times, yeah. I think, yeah. which is, yeah. uh, you know, we're all looking forward to more opportunity for that mm. at the moment, mm. aren't we? But what's very important is obviously you yourself have got different palates. It's about finding food and wine and trying different things that balance because it is all about those balances mm -hmm. and the different assistances, the different sugars really help those balances with the food you're drinking, food you're eating, should I say. So it's up to you because we have different palates to try those different things and experiment with wine and with food. And, you know. Mm -hmm. So here we've also got some local Suffolk salami yeah. from the co-op. And this again, going back to... Um, a big plate of prosciutto out in the garden as a, you know, a yeah. hors d'oeuvre or starter before your barbecue. Um, and again, we've got some lovely Suffolk blue and some Suffolk gold, which again, 
both are quite powerful, but we've got the power in the rosé to, to pair well with those. So, yeah, it's strong enough to stand yes, up, it is. isn't it, to yeah. the, yeah. Yeah. the yeah. flavours. Yeah. Wonderful. So I better ask some questions. I'm getting carried away with the wine and the, and the food. So I better ask some questions. I've got someone waving at me, telling me off. So, um, so um, well, I've got one here from, I think it's um, a colleague of mine who says, Toppersfield looks fabulous. I think he might be a little bit jealous that he's not here this <laughs> evening. <laughs> It's a tough job, I have to tell you. <laughs> so, um, what, and we've got a question here from Jacob. What varieties of grapes do you grow? Okay, so we grow two main varieties. We grow Pinot Noir, and that's what we're drinking here. That's 100% Pinot Noir, but the type is Pinot Noir Precoce. There's two types of Pinot Noir. There's Pinot Noir Classic, mm -hmm. which is a red grape with a white juice, and there's Pinot Noir Precoce, which we grow, which is basically a red grape with a red juice. The other variety um, is Bacchus. Now, Bacchus is known as the, as the Greek name for the god of wine. Um, it's traditionally, it's very successful in East Anglia. Our ground, our terroir here is um, chalk and boulder clay. And so the Bacchus is really well suited. We're the hottest county in the UK. And so it's a great variety to grow in East Anglia. Indeed, it's mainly produced um, in East Anglia. Mm. And what have we got? What can we see out the window? So out here, you can glorious see glorious window. Yeah, out of here, this is mainly Bacchus. Um, you can see that, and it's all just romping away at the moment. So um, yeah, it's. Um, so the first third about of the vineyard is is the Pinot Noir, and then we have an additional vineyard at the top. We can't see through this window, which is also the Pinot Noir. Amazing, amazing. So hang on. Um, so I've got another question here, um, which is probably one that. Um, uh, you know, lots of people think that. So why is English wine more expensive than New World wines or those from Europe? Do you want to answer mm. that? Well, this looks well. <laughs> it's a challenging question. Yeah. And this is something that the UK wine industry is constantly um, lobbying about because we feel it's very unfair, and particularly after Brexit, but also as we're trying to grow this industry, which is providing a lot of um, employment opportunities in the, in the new economy. Um, we pay £2.23 of duty in addition to VAT on an English wine, and that compares to probably eight or nine, nine euro euros cents on a, on a, a European of bottle of wine. So like for like, a bottle of French will come in, be duty paid in France, it'll sit on our shelves with under 10 pence of tax. We're already at £2.50 before we start, £2.23. Um, so, you know, there's just no comparison. And so, why, you know, it, it gets up to sort of, you know, much more expensive because of the duty we have to pay. Gosh, I, hadn't, I had no idea. Yeah. Which we feel is, you know, we can't really understand the logic behind that because yeah. we're trying to grow this industry and we're trying to get people to drink more English wine. And, you know, often people have been quite sceptical about English mm. wine and we've done lots of tastings in the local co-op stores, etc. Um, and I think once you explain to people that, A, we, you know, we have the, the, the duty issue, but we also, you know, are producing on a smaller scale generally yeah. than some of the huge great big vineyards that we have in um, the new world particularly yeah yeah well and i can testify to the quality and the absolutely it's gorgeous thank you got one more question um that says what is the optimum serving temperature for your wines or the wines that we've been talking about this evening well i would say that depends on you actually yeah. i would say it depends on you because as you warm a wine up the flavors get more intense so some people like a drier acidic wine and so that's colder as the wine warms, the flavours start pulling out. So it depends on how you like it. There's no right and wrong, to be honest. We drink our wine cool, cold, um, out of the fridge. But again, it's up and to And again, you. some people like to drink it with ice. Um, yeah. And again, if you're driving, for example, um, so that means you could have an extra glass if you have more ice in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, some people just like, and particularly if it's a really hot day and you're sitting out in the garden, then to have it really chilled is great. Um, and yeah. as the evening draws in, you might want it less chilled. So it's all about, you know, atmosphere, ambiance, as well Balance. as the actual, um, um, you know, temperature. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. No, and thank, thank you so much for having us. Yeah, not at all. It's been absolutely wonderful. So now we've got the final two films for you guys to watch at home now um, of the Source Locally Award um, uh, uh, um, shortlisters. So we've got Key Jade, who are sources. And also you may have spotted some of the hand sanitizers um, around this evening as well. Um, Key Jade's during the um, pandemic 
um, uh, actually switched over from making sauces to doing some hand sanitizers. Um, and then also we've got a short film from Haversfield as well, who are an egg producer. Both those guys are from Suffolk. The actual story of Key J's and the, particularly the product goes back to 1960. My father, he developed a recipe uh, which was then became, which actually became the Chinese curry that uh, the nation uh, uh, now knows. As far as Kijay is concerned, I thought that would be a good idea to commercially make the product uh, based on the recipe that my father developed for the Chinese kitchens at the time. Kijay's has around 40 staff. Uh, most of those are production actually in the factory making our products. In total, we probably produce around about 60 products. My favourite Kijay's product would have to be the Taste Penang Creamy Curry Coconut Sauce. And it's wonderful with some fresh prawns, just quickly cooked and served with rice. With some of the key pieces of equipment in our facility, it's pharmaceutical grade because of the innovative mainstream products that we um, produce. As such, we felt that uh, they'll be also able to do um, hand sanitizer gel. We wanted to help people. It was something that we'd never ever done before, but it was in short supply. We knew there was a challenge on our hands. Co-op gave us that confidence to pursue that commitment. Obviously sourcing the, the, the raw materials was the biggest problem. Everyone around the world was all trying to get their hands on, on alcohol. We went all over the world hours and hours and hours on the phone trying to actually source the, the alcohol so that we could bring it in to actually make the product. The fact that, that they've now chosen us to be finalists is absolutely amazing. I mean, the fact that as far as we're concerned, that is winning enough. However, now that we've been um, shortlisted to be the finalists, yes, it would be nice to, um, you know, to uh, go all the way, wouldn't it really? <laughs>
and we've got some diaper chicken kebabs that have been marinated in a chew spice going curry paste. I think that's the sort of curry the yeah, smell that Yeah, it's really we've got good and it, in, gets, yeah. it gets a really good caramel colour when it goes on the barbecue. Really mm -hmm. delicious. Um, and then I've done some vegetarian options. Um, these are... Here, yeah. So that we've got the capel uh, portobello Ooh, mushrooms that I've around. stuffed with <laughs> um, spinach and feta. And then I've used some uh, valley grown uh, vegetables. There's some courgette, peppers and onions that I made some kebabs with. And not to forget the, uh, the pudding, which is a, um, it's a twist on, a, on, a, on an eaten mess. So I've used uh, Steph's older, older uh, ice cream um, and strawberries and then made some uh, meringues. It looks amazing. I like Great. it really. I cannot, I cannot overstate how delicious everything smells. And we've got the wine in the we've other got the room wine, as well. We're so we're, we're really, yeah. really ready to go, aren't we? So you've, um, you've been cooking away in the background this yes. evening, haven't yeah. you? But you have actually, we, earlier in the week, didn't we? We did, we some, did some filming, filming. with you. Um, so we've um, got the recipes for everything here. Bar the salads, um, but the, the recipes for the meringues, the frittata uh, and everything on the barbecue will be up on the website, I believe, after the show. It will. Excellent. So I've got some questions. I've got a question here. Cooking okay. tip question. Cooking tip. So we've got, so not necessarily about everything that we've got here on the table. Um, they may come later when okay. uh, people have had a chance to look at the films. But um, so is the best part... Um, to cook, hang on, is it best to part cook a shoulder of lamb in the oven and finish it off on the barbecue or do you entirely cook it on the barbecue? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, for a shoulder of lamb, I would slow cook it first. Okay. Um, so yeah, slow cook it probably 140 degrees for a good sort of four hours. Wow. And then I would finish it on the barbecue. Sort of caramelise the, the last, the yeah. glaze, yeah. Unless you've got, um, uh, a very good sort of adjustable height barbecue where you can mm. slow cook it or you've got one of the eggs which you can set temperatures on but it does need a, a long slow cooking process really, yeah to break make it, down the, it gets too the, chewy otherwise yeah it just it? helps yeah. break down all the fibers in the meat so. yeah i've got another question here about whether the barbecue recipes are available on, on the website and they absolutely they are. are yes they yeah. are That's and great. uh picking up on a point i think steph made earlier about aquafaba you can make meringues with the aquafaba very similar recipe just uh put the drained chickpea water with a little bit of salt in a blender and whip it up with the sugar uh, it will just take a lot longer to whip up. Golly. So just bear with it. And 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 that you literally that's instead of the the, the egg the, whites the and egg the sugar. Whites and the sugar. So wow. yeah, the chickpea water and sugar, but it will just take probably triple the time to whip up. But uh, you wouldn't notice the difference when you come to eat them. Really? Yeah, they're very good. Ooh, we're big meringue fans in my house, so I might <laughs> give that a go. They're less keen on the chickpeas, my kids, so I might have to eat the chickpeas <laughs> and they'll be eating the meringues, I think. It's probably how it's going to go. So, um, have we got any more questions? Oh, what is the best meat to cook on a barbecue? The best meat. The best meat. The best meat on a barbecue is uh, a butterfly leg of lamb. Ooh, there we go. interesting. And again, personal that, preference, uh, personal yeah, I, I'm a lamb girl uh, all the way as well. But I would always go for barbecued lamb. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah. Yeah. Good I think, marinade yeah. first and then, uh, yeah. I would agree, actually. And I think that, um, so is that, and that one you would cook, you would barbecue straight from the beginning. You wouldn't do yeah, that in the no, oven first. No need. Okay. No, it's very, very quick to cook. Okay. And what would you say is the perfect burger? Like, you know, how you, not just, not just the cooking of the burger, but, you know, is it the sauce? Is it the bun? Yeah, these are I looking think pretty good. These I have are to be good. Honest, so. uh, bun plays a real part. So it's got to be a nice, soft, soft bun. Amazing. Um, Okay, that's fantastic. Um, and have you got a favourite burger sauce? Or are you not allowed to have favourites? Is it is it like David and his beer? You're not allowed to have a favourite ba burger sauce? Uh, I like a good pickly sauce, so lots of pickles. A bit of acidity. Yes. It's like the wine. Exactly. <laughs> I have been paying attention. I have, I have, I have. That's wonderful. Okay, so I think, I think that is all the questions. Oh no, there's one more from Paul. What are the best types of fish to barbecue? Fish on a barbecue. a really tricky question, isn't it? Well, yes and no. Uh, again, it depends on what you like to eat. Mm. But simplicity-wise, uh, tuna steaks are really simple to barbecue, as are swordfish. But mackerel on a barbecue or sea bass is oh, really good. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm, I like a sardine as well. Yeah. I do. Sardine, like yeah. Keep them whole or butterfly them, and yeah, straight on. Okay. And there's yeah. a question here from Helen. Um, how do you stop ribs going tight and chewy on the barbecue? Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Helen. <laughs> Um, similarly to the lamb shoulder, you can pre-braise them, yeah. so nice and slow, get them tender, glaze them, and then hard heat on the barbecue to give that caramel glaze. Amazing. Well, thank you very much, Paul. There's You're some welcome. lots of good <laughs> tips there. And as we said, all of the recipes and Paul showing us how to cook them, more importantly, I think for many of us, are, will be available on the website afterwards. So. I'm now going to invite everybody who's um, who's been with us here this evening to come over because we are going to let everybody have a little tuck in and enjoy um, enjoy the food um, as we go. I'm going to get up and move out the way. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us this evening. It's been absolutely wonderful to be here in Essex. Um, um, here at the Troppersfield Vineyard and thank you so much to all the guests that have joined us tonight um, and really really helped us um, hopefully make this a really enjoyable show for you all here this evening so please have a seat everybody and we're going to start tucking in shortly I've got a few more bits before we close the show for the evening so first of all um, I um, I want to talk to you about um, a partnership that we have with Ormiston Families. So this is an organisation that works across East Anglia, helping children who are having a tough time and feeling very vulnerable. And we are working with them on their fundraising campaign, which is a brighter barbecue. So if you're getting together with family or friends um, for a barbecue over the summer, then you can apply for a fundraising packs and we'll put the details of the website available online. Um, and you'll be helping by applying for that pack and fundraising you'll be helping those families in our region um, and you should be able to see the details yes the details are on the screen now so you can do that and we'll also make them available on the website afterwards one final plug for the source locally awards you've seen the six producers um, I think we're going to put some more information up online about how you vote it's very very easy um, and we'll also send you um, more information in the emails that follow the event as well. So please do go online. And remember, everyone who enters will be in with a chance of winning £500 um, of store vouchers um, to spend on delicious source locally products. Um, and I can recommend everything that we've had here tonight. Um, and don't forget as well, um, there's the co-op, East of England co-op store of the year um, option to vote there as well. And then finally, um, when I was in talking with Peter and Jane, you will have spotted a large and rather marvellous looking hamper on the counter. Now that's the prize draw for the people who've registered for this event. And I'm delighted to let you know that Ursula from Norwich, you are the lucky winner of that fabulous hamper. And the team will be in touch with you very, very soon um, to let you know how we'll be able to drop that off for you. And I hope you enjoy all of the delicious products that are in there. And I think there's some Toppersfield wine in there too. So you'll be able to take on some of the notes that Peter and Jane gave us earlier in the evening. So that's it for this evening. Uh, thank you once again for joining us from home and also to everybody that has joined us here this evening. And most of all, and um, to Peter and Jane for hosting us in this absolutely glorious setting. So thank you very much and we'll see you all again very, very soon. Bye bye.